I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit. Good morning, Toledo, and good afternoon, Columbus, and hello to those of you listening on the internet, wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar, and for the next hour, you are, will be listening to, hopefully, For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a program where we talk about ecology, and we talk about the environment. We talk about them in terms of your wealth, your health, your happiness, because it's very clear that, that natural things part of ecology, the living organisms that we share this planet with, and I guess in this case the sort of half-living organisms like viruses, uh, those affect you directly. And so a healthy environment, a healthy ecology means that you will be healthier and wealthier and happier. And uh, so that's why we bring you For a Green Future each week so that we can look at what's going on in the world of ecology and the environment and uh, your role in it. And we have a really good show lined up for you tonight, today, this morning, or whatever you're listening. Uh, like everyone else, I, I'm unable to get to the studio, so I'm broadcasting from my living room today on my computer here. But I've been watching some of the late night talk show hosts, and uh, I gotta tell you, they seem just too comfortable because they're broadcasting from their own kitchens and their own hallways and libraries and wherever, porches and backyards, and they just, it seems like they lack that edge, you know, that, that little edge. I mean, when I normally go into the studio, okay, you, the doorman lets you in, you walk past the, the lobby with the fountains and the ferns, and you go down the big hallway with the impressionistic paintings up on the wall, and you really feel like you're doing something important, you know, you're on your way to, to do a great public service, but... Uh, here in my own living room, I felt like I might kind of lose that that studio edge. So uh, I know a lot of people are broadcasting from like in their pajamas and things like that. Well, I, I kind of went the other way. I I'm actually broadcasting. I'm actually wearing a tuxedo here in my living room. And uh, the funny thing is, of course, I only own one tuxedo, and that's the one I got married in, which I still kind of fit in. But uh, I got married in 1984, so yes, it is a tuxedo, absolutely, but it's uh, it's maroon because that was the style at the time. So uh, so that's that's what I'm doing to, to keep my edge here. Unfortunately, my co-host, my normal co-host, is in her apartment in Toledo. She's uh, She may call in later. I hope she does. And uh, you can call in at any time at 866 240 one zero six five. That's eight six six two four zero one zero six five. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Uh, we're we're going to have uh, first. We're going. I wanted to talk a little bit more about signs of spring, but specifically, I wanted to talk about hidden gems. You know, hidden natural gems. Because one thing people are allowed to do in this uh, days of the days of COVID here is to go out into nature, to go out into the parks and walk around. And, and uh, my wife and I, uh, we took our neighbor, uh, 
who's stranded in the United States. She's actually from Austria, but she can't go back to Austria. And so we took her to see Oak Openings. And uh, Oak Openings, uh, I'm happy to report in terms of nature, is still going strong. In fact, uh, I, I made a little recording here. Russell, I, I hope this doesn't blow your levels here, but let me play this for everybody. Yes, those are the, the spring peepers at op- openings. And as you can tell, they're going strong. Nature is continuing. You know, the birds and the bees are starting to come back. And I find great solace in that. And we've always loved oak openings. That's been, that park has been a part of our family ever since uh, my wife and I got back, got together way back in the, in the eighties. And, it's just been interesting to watch it grow and develop as the trees have gotten bigger, as they've taken over larger sections. There's a part where they actually took over a road, and the road has been uh, going back to nature for the past 10 or 15 years. And so I, I wanted to ask you folks, call in at any time at 866-240-1065, do you know of a hidden gem, a, a hidden place that, Maybe you could recommend to people that they go in this time of stress to get back in touch with nature, to see something really cool. I'm originally from Western New York, and we have a – there's a hidden gem in Western New York I'm going to share with you. It's called Letchworth State Park. And most people don't know about Letchworth State Park because, you know, it's it's hidden in the, in the depths of Western New York. Everybody thinks New York City, Catskills, Adirondacks. Well – Letchworth Park is this 20-mile-long park that goes along the Letchworth River, and it's a beautiful gorge that is uh, has three separate waterfalls in it, and uh, the trees have been growing unmolested for for something like 50 years. It's just this beautiful, deep forest that's along this absolutely gorgeous gorge, gorgeous gorge, yes, and, you know, there's the when the sun is out and there's foam coming off these really big waterfalls there's rainbows everywhere everybody knows about niagara falls which is the big tourist attraction but we've got a hidden gem called letchworth and ohio has some hidden gems too we we mentioned one of them last week we were talking about um clifton gorge and that's john bryant state park down there by yellow springs that i also consider that a, a local hidden gem and how about you? Do you do you have some place you'd like to share with everybody where you could recommend maybe some place that's not quite as busy as some of these metro parks? I mean, that is one good thing. The one thing we're allowed to do is go out to these metro parks. But my wife and I went out to our usual trail uh, last week when we had that nice sunny day, and there were 40 or 50 people <laughs> on that little section of trail. And so you couldn't really maintain that social distance. So we actually went on to a further section of the trail where most people don't go and uh, we had a nice walk. But hidden gems, you know, they're, they're those kind of quiet natural spaces where as they say somewhere in the Bible it says, woe unto them that lay house to house and field to field until there be no such place where a man may be alone with the earth. So if you know of one of these places where a person will upgrade this a little bit, where a person can be alone with the earth, give us a call at 866-240-1065. But just as the nature keeps going, just as spring is springing, no matter you know what's happening with our, our human society, uh, human society keeps going, the environmental news keeps coming. And uh, first up, I have a, an interview with uh, Tom Pelton. We're going to be hearing that shortly. And then after that interview, we'll be hearing from our wonderful, wonderful sponsors and then some eco news that you could use. And uh, so and then, of course, our letter for the future. Now, of course, our my great great granddaughter living 300 years in the future is not a fact. But uh, right now we have to report on uh, something. It, this actually was a very fast breaking story. It, it happened. Uh, the story started Thursday night. 
and then it has continued uh, Friday, and that is that the Trump administration has seized upon the excuse of the COVID virus to completely eliminate enforcement of environmental regulations. And you might be saying, what? (laughs) A lot of people are saying, what? Uh, This is just an insane move. And one thing about a person, when you really, really find out about a person and what they're like and what they actually believe is when they have an advantage. You know, when when they have an opportunity, what do they do with that opportunity? Do they help people? Do they make the situation better? Or do they seize on that opportunity to advance their own interests, to make their own uh, profits and to, to advantage themselves and disadvantage the other people they have an advantage over? Well, right now, what happened is that the Environmental Protection Agency has seized upon the COVID crisis to say that we are no longer going to enforce environmental law. And uh, this might seem fantastic to you, but... Uh, as we'll hear shortly from our guest, Tom Pelton, that's exactly what they're doing. They they are, it, well, I think we'll just go to the interview. Uh, Russell, are you ready? This is Tom Pelton, Director of Communications for the Environmental Integrity Project. Uh, we're an 18-year-old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based in Washington, D.C. that enforces environmental laws to protect public health. All right, great. Thanks, Tom. And and what's your position in the organization? I'm the director of communications. All right. Well, thanks very much for being on for a green future. I think, sure. Uh, let's let's just dive right into this here. Um, I'm contacting you because uh, you were amongst a, a group of environmental organizations that kind of broke this story that uh, the Trump administration, the EPA, is planning to cease enforcement of environmental regulations during the COVID crisis. Um, and you folks wrote a letter to the Trump administration and the EPA opposing this. Could you tell us a little bit about what this letter was, why you feel this is a bad idea, and uh, so forth? Yeah. Uh, about 4 o'clock on Thursday, uh, the EPA's director of enforcement, uh, Susan Bodine, uh, posted a letter on their website basically telling industry that they're not going to penalize them for violating especially pollution monitoring requirements uh, and other basically pollution control rules during the coronavirus crisis. Um, and, you know, they say that, you know, they're only doing this if the COVID virus or the COVID disease plays a role in an inability of a company to be able to uh, conduct their operations. But as we know, uh, almost all operations of all uh, facilities are impacted to some extent by the um, uh, personnel impact. I mean, a lot of people are staying at home. Uh, so basically, this is uh, what appears to be more or less a blanket uh, waiver uh, of penalties for big polluters during this uh, COVID uh, virus crisis. And we think this is a terrible idea because, of course, the coronavirus uh, attacks the lungs. Uh, and people are more vulnerable if there's more air pollution. Uh, and so if you're telling essentially big refineries uh, or big chemical plants, uh, eh, don't worry about penalties. Uh, this is like a snow day for you, you know, kind of a day off. Uh, that's going to be more air pollution. And especially older people who are very susceptible to uh, asthma attacks, um, they could be more likely to suffer catastrophic pneumonia from the coronavirus if there's more air pollution and more irritation of their lungs. So we think it's a terrible policy. Yeah, I, I, I think that the reaction has been uh, one of shock from a lot of people that, that the EPA would, at this critical time, abandon its, its responsibility to protect the health and, and as you say, specifically the lungs of, of Americans. But yeah, it, not so much shock. I mean, you know, the, the fact is the Trump administration uh, throughout his entire uh, three years of plus in office has been uh, de-emphasizing enforcement, uh, allowing polluters to do what they want. We, we came out with a report last February uh, that documented uh, an historic low in penalties against polluters by the Trump EPA. 
so the Trump EPA has really been, well, I mean, it's run by a former coal lobbyist, Andrew Wheeler. They're essentially working for industry. Uh, and so it's not shocking that a uh, an agency that has been captured by industry would, uh, during a crisis, um, decide to side with industry instead of the public. Uh, that's what happens when you have a hostile takeover uh, of uh, the government by people who hate government. So you you don't think it's just that uh, there's l- less enforcement because under Trump the the corporations just feel you know better and that they should be good now because because <laughs> Trump is the president you don't think it's an improvement in behavior <laughs> you think maybe that's a lack of enforcement it's a lack of enforcement yeah absolutely I, we've actually looked at the emissions records of the um, industries and they're not polluting less. Um, although it is true, what's interesting is during the uh, coronavirus crisis, uh, people are driving less and, you know, the oil refineries are refining less because the whole economy is basically shut down. So during the last couple of weeks, there, there actually has been uh, a lot less uh, industrial activity and driving activity. Uh, but some of these like chemical plants, um, for example, are still telling their, their employees to go to work, keep working. Um, and we think that in those circumstances, EPA should be making them. If they still have the staff that's there, they're making them work, just make sure that they're also following the pollution control limits and running their pollution control equipment, and don't just shut off those precautions uh, because you see an opportunity. Right. Now, you had mentioned this is in- predictable in the context of the Trump administration's actions on other pollutants. and sure. And, you know, we've been following that on our show for the past year or so, and it's kind of amazing. He's he's trying to reduce emission controls on things like mercury, and yeah. and even he's trying to even bring back asbestos, which uh, right, yeah. It's, and vehicle emission controls. The Obama administration did a great job of requiring our vehicles to be more fuel efficient, and Trump is trying as hard as he can to undermine that. He wants people to drive bigger, fatter, more high polluting vehicles. But he falsely claims are safer. They're not safer. They're safer maybe for the driver of the vehicle, but not for the person in the next vehicle, the smaller vehicle they hit and kill. Uh, so, you know, they, 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 they've been doing a lot of deregulatory actions over the last three years on, on a whole range of fronts, uh, from coal and ice pollution to Clean Water Act protections for wetlands and streams, rolling those back too. So basically doing everything they can to... Um, eliminate regulations uh, and, and roll back regulations. And the great tragedy here is the claim that this is somehow going to help jobs, that's just a lie. We did a big study. We looked at 20 years of all of the peer-reviewed economics literature on this subject. It's been studied extensively. And uh, only two-tenths of one percent of all layoffs are caused by regulations of all kinds. Uh, and that includes environmental regulations. Uh most of the time, environmental regulations have zero impact on jobs. Uh, occasionally, uh, environmental regulations create jobs. If you tell a sewage plant to upgrade, they're going to have to hire local construction workers and engineers to make a better sewage plant. Um, if you tell a coal-fired power plant to install a scrubber to reduce air pollution, they're going to have to hire a lot of engineers and buy a lot of a steel to make a, 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 a scrubber, which is a, a billion-dollar project. So often, pollution control regulations create jobs not destroy them. Uh, and so this is all predicated on this big lie that Trump keeps repeating that somehow regulations are job killers and he's helping the economy by uh, jeopardizing our, our health. Um, and it just, you know, it's just propaganda. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that there's a definite loss to the economy. I don't know if it's been measured in studies, but when people are sick because of air pollution, when people For have sure. asthma attacks and have to stay home. Oh, yeah. Then, you know. Yeah. As a matter of fact, whenever EPA imposes new air pollution regulations, for example, in 1990, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, a Republican, uh, signed an amendment to the Clean Air Act that greatly reduced air pollution o- over the, the two decades that followed. Um, they had to do a study that showed the impact on work days and school days. And what they found is that people can go to work more often and kids can go to school more often if they're not having asthma attacks, if they're not having um, lung disease. Um, and so, you know, when you reduce pollution, it, it does help worker health and student health and helps the whole economy. Yeah, because uh, 
part of it, I think if you're not sick, you're more likely to go out and, and purchase things and, and do activities that, that... Right, and when you are sick, it costs the economy a huge amount of money. I, I did uh, a report um, it's about seven years ago. There was a West Virginia uh, economist who looked at the West Virginia coal mining industry and its net economic impact after you look at the cost of black lung disease and other health problems caused by mining coal. Uh, actually, the mining industry in West Virginia has a net negative impact on the West Virginia economy if you take into account the medical costs of all the mm. coal miners and the people who live nearby. They, they talk all the time about the jobs and the paychecks they need. Well, okay, but how about the medical bills that accompany those paychecks? Often those are astronomical. People often have to be on, you know, ventilators and have, you know, years and years of medical uh, treatments after they've uh, retired early because of black lung disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, there often is a, a real strong negative impact of pollution on our economy and people should remember that. Yeah, well, and plus people die younger, so they're yeah. you know, they're contributing to the economy fewer years, you know. Right. So, that's yeah. right. Hmm. Yeah, one thing in the the articles on this um uh, that I've read that caught my eye is that specifically this was what seemed to be the trigger is a letter from the American Petroleum Institute. That's right. Um but it but and they they specifically wanted relief from uh, polluting water. They specifically wanted to be able to pollute our waterways without having to report it. And uh, but it seems like the the response to the letter was actually even more than the Petroleum Institute could have dreamed of. Sure. Yeah. They they basically got that letter from the API, uh, and uh, I, I'll bet you they were also getting. If not letters, um, at least uh, you know phone calls and emails uh, from other industries, um, and also th they know what they want to do. They want to eliminate the EPA. Uh, they want to eliminate uh, environmental regulations at the federal level. They claim that the states will pick up the slack, and this really should be a states' rights issue. You hear that a lot from the Republicans, in particular. Uh, it kind of echoes uh, the old Confederacy. Leave it to the states. We get the federals off our back. Uh, however, we did a study just two months ago that showed that uh, often the state environmental agencies over the last decade have been cut back more severely than the EPA has been cut back. Uh, if the EPA has been cut back something like 17% over the last uh, decade, if you look at the key pollution control programs, a lot of um, states have been cut back even more, uh, and their staffing has been cut back more severely than the EPA. So, it's kind of, uh, once again, there's this kind of fable that the states can pick up the slack when the feds uh, reduce the regulations. In fact, what happens is uh, no one picks up the slack, and we just have more pollution. Yeah, and I, the Republicans like to hide behind that states' rights thing until a state tries to be more stringent than the federal right. government. Right, like California is a great example. California does have stronger air pollution rules and has back to 1970 uh, because of their historic smog problems in Los Angeles. And so for years, the EPA has allowed uh, California to take a stronger stance. And there's a whole bunch of states across the country that use those California standards for their vehicle emissions. And now the Trump administration wants to say, oh, no, 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 no. States' rights only if it's states' rights that benefit polluting industries. If you want to have states' rights that benefit the public, forget about it. And they're trying to do away with that stronger air pollution control system that California has. Right. So they, they're saying the states have a right to be more polluted, but not right. less polluted. That's right. <laughs> not, not cleaner. They could, they could be dirtier, but they can't be cleaner. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. It, it, you know, one thing about the water uh, question with the American Petroleum Institute, I mean, one of the irresponsible things I've been seeing people doing in the whole COVID crisis is stocking up on water i see, see them buying flats of water and you know as far as i know our water right. water treatment our water is fine are yeah. still fine but conceivably if the epa stops enforcing water pollution controls i suppose our water supplies actually could get threatened well you're in toledo right and yeah. uh that is threatened in the summertime when you have uh the, that blue green algae uh that breaks out uh, on on uh, uh, Lake, Lake Erie, Lake Erie, right? Yeah. 
Uh, um, and um, was that Toledo or was that Akron about four or five years ago? I had to shut down their water for a couple of days. No, that was Toledo. Yeah, that, that was Toledo. That was, so, so you yeah. know what I'm talking about. I mean, it, oh, if yeah. you don't keep on top of, in that case, it's agricultural runoff. Um, that that you know, from all the farms uh, in uh, northern Ohio, going into the Maumee River, all the nutrients causing huge blue green algae. Um, outbreaks on uh, Lake Erie causing the toxic algae shut down your water supply right. uh, a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it absolutely is a, a public health issue. Um, and, you know, in a way, it's, it's, it's about who is this government looking out for? Is it looking out for the average people and what we breathe and what we drink? Or is it looking out essentially for the, the big corporations uh, and those lobbyists for them, like the American Petroleum Institute? And in this case, you know, Trump calls himself a populist. But he's not. He's a corporatist. You know, all he does is cut taxes for the big corporations. And he, he, he gives the people hate uh, and it's xenophobia uh, and resentment. That, that's, that's the gift he gives them is hatred. Uh, but he doesn't give them any kind of real benefits in terms of money or protection of their health. He gives all the money to the big giant corporations and his billionaire friends. So he's, he's quite the hypocrite. Yeah, we we cover Trump's uh, foibles quite a bit here on on Four Agreed Future. We we like to stay focused on just on the the environmental aspect of it because this is real physical harm that he's doing yeah. to our listeners, fr- friends, and families, and health. And he's use it seems like it perhaps you'd agree with this that he's using a health crisis to threaten our health. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, there's a thing called disaster capitalism, uh, and that is when there is some kind of a catastrophe, um, often uh, you'll have industries rush to get advantages um, from the government uh, that they could not have gotten in a normal time of, of democracy. And That's exactly what's happening here. Uh, it's disaster capitalism. We have a disaster. Uh, and the industries would like to relax the public health standards that they're supposed to follow. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's really taking advantage uh, uh, of a situation that, that they really should be more sensitive, more sensitive to their fellow American citizens. Right. Well, I know that since Thursday, there's been a, a huge outcry, and a, a lot of people and organizations are, are following this now and opposing it. Uh, do you think there's any realistic chance that the EPA could be forced to reverse themselves on this, um, either through the courts or some other method? Uh, I think it's going to be tough because this is not a law that Congress could overturn, um, it, it, and it's not even a regulation which you could uh, sue easily to uh, have the courts reverse. It's an internal policy, and the EPA in general has... Uh, enforcement discretion, um, just like a cop can decide whether to charge someone speeding or not. It's, it's kind of up to his discretion uh, or her discretion. And the EPA does have enforcement discretion under the law, and this is kind of just a, a policy uh, that are, they're essentially saying, we're going to choose not to use our authority much during this um, virus crisis. So uh-huh. it's a tough thing. It's, it's a tough thing for, for uh, groups to challenge in the courts. Um, the way it needs to be challenged is in the voting box. In November, uh, when people go to vote, they should remember to vote for uh, a candidate who protects the environment, uh, not one who allows pollution to go rampant during a crisis. Yeah, I see. So, it, so it's basically it's, it's the the crooked sheriff scenario, <laughs> where basically the cop on the beat has decided, oh, you know, these donuts are really nice. I'm just gonna look the other way, and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, think about it. If, if the director of the EPA, Andrew Wheeler, is a former coal lobbyist, uh, that's like having a drug dealer as your sheriff, um, a gangster as your sheriff. Uh, you know, if the person put in charge is someone who has been working to do the opposite of what the agency is supposed to be doing, yeah, that, that, that is like, like, like putting the, the drug dealer in charge of the police department. Uh, and so, you know, this is what you get. And this is what voters have to vote for. Do you want this? Is this what you want? Is this the government you want? A government that when we have a pandemic says to industry, hey, go ahead and pollute. Don't worry about it. We're not going to be watching. Is that what you want? People need to, need to think about that in November. All right. Well, well, Tom, thanks so much for joining us. It's been uh, yeah. 
It's been a, a, an intense interview. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about your organization if they want more information? Where can they go? On? Yeah, sure. Uh, the Environmental Integrity Project, which you can find our website at environmentalintegrity.org, as an 18-year-old uh, nonprofit organization. It was founded by the former head of enforcement at EPA, Eric Schaefer, uh, who used to be basically in charge of going after big polluters. Uh, and then during the George W. Bush administration, Dick Cheney and his friends tried to tell my boss, Eric Schaefer, to lay off and stop going after the big coal plants. He said, no, I have to enforce the law, so I'm going to quit. And so he quit the EPA and instead made his own group, the Environmental Integrity Project, which basically is dedicated to the enforcement of environmental laws. Uh, and so we go out there and we sue big polluters, uh, but then we also write uh, investigative reports about pollution issues and how to improve public policy to protect public health. And in this case, what we did was we rallied about 25 other environmental organizations in writing a letter of protest to the EPA that we sent on Thursday to say this is a terrible idea to grant waivers during this virus crisis. All right. Well, Tom, thank you very much. And uh, Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, hopefully we can hear from you in the future. All right. Well, let's hope we can hear from Tom in the future, and uh, let's hope we have a future because, frankly, some of the things that – some of the actions being taken by Trump in this crisis are uh, sort of putting that into question in terms of economics and environment and, and our health. But – um, one thing that we don't question, one thing that we're extremely grateful for, is our sponsors. And uh, we have our For a Green Future is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming that teaches people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead people on outdoor adventures. The Wood County Parks protects natural spaces all around Wood County for all to enjoy. They're open from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. And there's several ways you could get in touch with the Wood County Park District. If you've got some questions about what the park's doing during this time of crisis, for example, the parks are open, but all the playgrounds are closed. But uh, if you want more information, you can contact them at 419-353-1897, or you can go to wcparks.org. And finally, you can go to their website and go to the App Store and download their app, which is WC Parks. You just go to any App Store and search for WC Parks. It's a free app, and they'll tell you what's going on in the Wood County Parks. So uh, Wood County Park District, we're very grateful to have them as a sponsor. And we're very grateful for our patrons. Our patrons are people who've gone to patreon.com and just searched for For a Green Future. And there's a whole uh, range of patronage that you could do in terms of how much per month. It's a very easy process. You don't notice it's happening. But we notice because we're, we're very dependent on our patrons, we couldn't bring this show to you without them, so we're very grateful. Um, what do you think about what Tom had to say at 866-240-1065? That's 866-240-1065. Hoping to get some calls here before the, the hour is out. and We're racing along towards that hour. We had kind of a slow start there because of technical things. I'm still talking to you from the living room, and I'm hoping you can hear me. <laughs> I'm sure we're doing fine with Russell at the helm. So uh, 866-240-1065, we are asking you about your hidden gems, the, the little parks, the little natural spaces. Maybe there's somewhere on the coast there. Maybe there's somewhere along Lake Erie that you think is really, really cool that, that people might enjoy during this time when we're being forced to to just be ourselves and to get out in nature. That's our exercise. And uh, so... Hope to hear from you at 866-240-1065. Now it's time to talk a little bit about some eco news. And the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, is more political than eco, but it impacts directly on ecology because as we've sh- said on this show and as we've shown, 
the only holdup, the only thing blocking us from a green future, that is a future with clean energy sources, a future where where, where the environment is healthy and we are healthy, are the political decisions that are being made. I mean, it's very clear in the case of wind power where uh, Republican legislatures in Ohio are opposed to wind power, so they've put laws into place that block wind power. And so we don't have significant wind energy generation here, whereas you go to a state like Nebraska where they have, uh, where they favor wind power, there's turbines everywhere. The state of Nebraska is often exporting wind power to other states because they're generating so much. And, you know, we could be doing that too. We could be getting the local benefit. But that's just one example. I, as I've said before on this show, I'm the political director of the Ohio Green Party, although I am not speaking for the Green Party on this show. I'm speaking only for myself, just as you would speak for yourself if you called in at 866-240-1065. And we have a problem. There's a political problem with this COVID crisis, and that is that we are being prevented from gathering the petition signatures we need to put our candidates on the ballot in the fall. I mean, it's pretty clear, you know, you've been told we have to stay in place. We've been told don't go visit people. And so doing something like going door to door collecting petition signatures has been directly forbidden by the governor. And we're not going to do it because we we understand transmission of disease. We're not going to put people at risk by sending our petitioners around. But it does mean that right now there's we have no way to get an alternative to the current political system on the ballot in November. And so that's a story that I wanted to point that out. We are trying to contact state legislators and the governor and the secretary of state. We've been trying to get through to them to try to get some kind of accommodation uh, on this question. But so far, all we've gotten has been the runaround. And it's clear to me, I mean, this is why I'm personally a uh, member of the Green Party and the political director of the Green Party, that we have to have some kind of political alternative to the two-party system we've got now. And to literally forbid it, to literally get up on a podium and say, you cannot go uh, door-to-door, you can't collect petition signatures, you can't participate in the political process, uh, that causes me real problems. That is a violation, in my opinion, of the freedom of America, of, of our political system. We're supposed to live in a democracy, but we're actually being forbidden from participating in that democracy with COVID as, as the excuse. So hopefully I'll be able to bring you more information about that. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about and a story that we've been following is the Wet'suwet'en tribe up in uh, the unceded territories that, that are located inside the Canadian province of British Columbia. They've been fighting a gas pipeline, which the government is trying to push through their unceded territories. And I called up there to see how they're doing, and they are embroiled in this COVID crisis too. Uh, They have people on those reservations that are very isolated, and so it's hard to get them supplies because you can't get you. They don't want to have people carry the virus to their their isolated encampments because it's very difficult for them to get to hospitals. One thing they're also very worried about is that the pipeline company, even though they have stopped pipeline construction at, at the moment, they are still sending in hundreds of workers into these tiny little communities in hotels and so forth. And they're very afraid that, that, that the pipeline workers will bring disease into the communities. And so that's a, a real fear. But Right now, it seems like there's sort of a standoff. There's the, the the pipeline company has stopped cutting down trees and clearing the path for the pipeline for the moment because it's uh, the snow is melting. The six-foot snowpack is turning into mush, so you just can't get heavy machinery in there. So everybody's sort of on pause up there in uh, in the, the unceded territories of the Wet'suwet'en tribe, but we will continue to follow that. And another environmental story that uh, is worth noting is that yesterday, Saturday, that was the 41st anniversary of the Three Mile Island 
nuclear disaster, the partial meltdown. And there are a number of lessons learned in that meltdown, uh, all of which are being ignored right now by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Because, because of the COVID crisis, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is trying to create a situation where the nuclear power companies can operate their nuke plants with a skeleton staff so that they can keep operating even as they start to get sick and, and incapacitated. They want to go to uh, just a few people running these huge complex machines. They want to see safety inspections which means that, you know, if there's a pipe leaking somewhere, if some valve is about to go, uh, right now they have to do regular safety inspections and catch those things before they actually cause problems. Well, kind of like the polluting industries with the EPA, the nuclear industry is saying, hey, we don't need, we can't do things during this danger time. And so they are actually putting us all at risk with one, a skeleton crew, then two, having those skeleton crews more likely to face uh, failures during the operation of the plant. And, uh, you know, they're, they're restarting or they were trying to restart Davis Bessie and they had such a failure just this past, during this past week. Feed water pumps, the pumps that keep the coolant flowing and keep the plant from melting down failed as they were trying to restart the plant. And they, so they had to scram the, the nuclear reactor and they had to figure out, oh, it's a fuse and they replaced the fuse and now they're trying to start it up again. But had they done safety inspections, maybe they would have caught that fuse before the pumps actually failed during the operation of the plant. So we had another close call with Davis Bessie over in the past week. But the biggest problem that they're doing, the biggest fear, the most fearful thing that they're nuclear industry is doing during the COVID crisis is they are asking for a delay in refueling. And this might sound like it's not terribly serious. Oh, they just want to delay the refueling. No problem. But the problem is that these nuclear fuel rods, the reason you have to refuel is not that the fuel in the rods has been used up. It's actually the opposite what happens in a nuclear power plant is all, you got all these neutrons shooting around and they keep hitting the atoms in the nuclear fuel rods. And so it's not that the uranium and plutonium that are, that's fissioning into these nuclear plants, it's not that it's getting used up. It's that there are more unstable radioactive isotopes being created in those rods. And so they actually get more and more radioactive as the plant operates, and this, this is a reminder that a nuclear plant is basically the same as a nuclear bomb. It's just a slow motion nuclear bomb. And so they get closer and closer to that criticality, that get closer and closer to that dangerous point where the reaction just runs away. And that's why you have to take a spent, quote unquote, spent fuel rod out and replace it with a fresh rod. So running a plant which is supposed to be refueling with these overuse these extremely radioactive and unstable fuel rods, that's literally begging for a meltdown. And especially if you've got a, a, a skeleton staff who hasn't done any safety inspections, this is pretty crazy. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just needs to shut the nukes down during the COVID crisis, not let them skate along with uh, fewer controls and, and fewer safety rate precautions. So it's it's a scary situation, but we're, you know, we're going to keep an eye on it and fingers are crossed. But one of the main lessons of the Fukushima disaster is that natural disasters can then lead to nuclear disasters because nuke plants require so much care, so much attention. If anything interrupts any of the feeds, any of the systems that are keeping a, the nuke plant running safely, you can have a disaster, so we're going to keep watching that and praying that there are no disasters. But one thing that we do know, because uh, we get a letter every week from 300 years in the future, is that eventually we'll figure this all out. Eventually, sanity will prevail. Eventually, these uh, the realization that the health of the environment literally is our health, both economic and physical. And how do we know this? Because 
we get my letter, the letter for my great-great-granddaughter, Marie I. And here's this week's letter. Dear GGG, well, I'm starting to show already. This was the week that I could stand in front of the mirror sideways, and you could definitely tell that I have a baby bump. It's hard to describe, but there's this underlying happiness in everything I do now. I never felt this way before. At times, I'm almost giddy. Things are going well for Michael, too. They finally come up with a solution for the drilling problem. They've completely redesigned the drill. Now, instead of just a round tube with long sections of pipe, they're using short sections shaped like blunt teardrops. Each section has sensors to detect which way the semi-molten rocks are trying to flow past. The pointy end of the teardrop can vibrate at ultrasonic speed. It will keep itself pointed into the oncoming rocks and be able to cut through them like butter. Michael and his team had to create a whole new alloy of iron, nickel, silicon, and tungsten. Michael's going to show me the drill next week in his lab. It's really a work of genius. I know you're going through tough times right now, great-great-grandpa, but don't worry, we will learn important lessons from them, and learning to respect the power of nature in your time is part of how we get to the wonderful green future that I'm living in now. Thank you, GGG. Love, Marie I. So that was a, a very nice letter from my great-great-granddaughter. What do you think? We've got time for one call, and I, I'm really hoping we get that one call at 866-240-1065. And, uh, you know, the reason I do this show is because I think we can learn. I think we can be taught. I think that humans have this amazing capacity to change their behavior based on what information they get. And we have done incredible changes in our behaviors incredibly rapidly. And the, we can, the, the stuff we need to do, the, the changes we need to make in order to get to a green future are actually less radical than the changes we've already made in the past two weeks to fight the, the coronavirus. And so, you know, it's just a reminder that, that we can do these things. What we need is leadership. What we need are people to, to push us in the right direction. And so I think that it's very important that all of us become those people, that we become the ones that are pushing, that we become the ones that are that are saying, hey, wait, you've got to take the environment into account when you're making these decisions. And in my experience, there's a, a direct correlation between democracy and environment. And that is, the more democracy you have, the better your environment. Because the people who live in an area understand they have to protect that area. It's when there's big decisions made centralized decisions or decisions that people don't have input on, that that's when the mistakes are made. That's when the environment gets destroyed and degraded. And uh, unfortunately, another one of the effects of this virus is that public comment periods and public hearings and public meetings on a lot of environmental projects are just being eliminated, and there's no alternative being presented. And so literally people are just being cut out of the planning process on a lot of environmental decisions, regulation changes, and, uh, and eco-projects and so forth. And I am a fundamental believer in democracy. And I, you know, people, I believe that democracy is one of the greatest governing methods ever devised. And so having this situation where people are using the excuse of a virus to literally eliminate democracy, this is unacceptable. And so uh, I want to leave you with this thought that, you know, you are still a citizen of the United States. You're not just someone sheltering in your living room. We're all part of a, a greater country, and that country can be a fantastic country, a wonderful country, if we respect the laws of nature that bound our actions and the actions of everyone else on the planet. So don't 
worry. You know, get out in nature, enjoy some of this wonderful spring. Go hear the spring peepers. And uh, thank you again for listening to another hour of For a Green Future. This is Joe Damar signing off. Radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us cussing and fighting. And I do believe it's time we was done. No, no, no.